I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 334. Feels like we've done more than that for some reason. It is uh, the third week of April, 2023. I'm Ethan. Welcome, Crab fans. I'm Liam. <laughs> so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. Well, we're on the road to WWE Backlash. And oh boy. <laughs> It's exciting. The build for this program has not been exciting. Uh, yeah. We have two matches announced for the show, which takes place in just over two weeks in San Juan, Puerto Rico. We have Cody Rhodes versus Brock Lesnar. Mm-hmm. All right. And we have a six man tag with the newly returned Riddle teaming with. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn against the Usos and Solo Sokoa. Mm-hmm. This is this is a house show card if ever I've seen one, uh, except for Cody and Brock, I guess. Yeah, I mean we we can we can ascertain that there's probably going to be a some sort of tag match with Ray and Bad Bunny, but obviously that hasn't been announced officially yet, but. Yeah, I think I think this is going to be one of those shows. The crowd will be hot. It'll be a fun show to watch. But if you're looking for, you know, a great deal of uh, development uh, in as far as long term directions or you're looking for, uh, you know, any, anything super memorable, uh, I, don't, I don't think this is the show for you. Oh, I guess uh, if you're a fan of Bad Bonnie, he is returning to uh, mm-hmm. WWE uh, on Raw this week to shoot an angle for whatever it is. He's going to do it backlash. Uh, probably uh, Ray and Bunny against Dominic and uh, his tall friend. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the big kid, the kid with the big head. <laughs> Damian Priest, yes. <laughs> anyway, Matt Riddle is back on this show and uh, inserted back in the main event program. And uh, as... There will be a theme throughout this program as we see if you can discern it as we start talking about AEW later. Boy, Matt Riddle's back. That seems like a bad idea. Well, um, (laughs) he was gone for a long time. Uh, Yeah. Does not have seemed to have learned any lessons. (laughs) And uh, I guess he'd been ready to come back for a while and they were just holding him off but uh well i guess if you aren't gonna fire him you might as well throw him on there i don't know that i'd be putting him in like a top program um if i were them based on his recent track record doesn't seem like a a safe thing to do from a business perspective um but hey we for whatever reason Everybody up top in WWE like likes this guy enough to uh, you know to roll out the red carpet and uh, put him right back kind of where he was uh, was before he before he left. So we can talk about um, since the the since since uh, Vince is back, mm-hmm. um, these shows are 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 back to uh, like nothing happens. And like they weren't exactly uh, crash TV attitude era Raws when Hunter was uh, fully in charge <laughs> either. Um, things, stories kind of moved at a snail's pace, et cetera, et cetera. However, things have really slowed down <laughs> mm-hmm. in the uh, three episodes of Raw now since two episodes, three episodes, three episodes three. of Raw since WrestleMania. And um, it feels to me as though we have one new story among the two matches here, and it's Cody and Brock, and it's not a particularly strong story. And um, Brock turned on Cody after two and a half hours of build. Mm -hmm. And uh, Roman is the champion, and he's he's not in for this cycle. 
And uh, the, I guess, maybe it feels to me like it's time for the bloodline versus uh, Kevin and Sammy and uh, now by extension Riddle, Riddle to be over. And I understand you have to do a rematch, I guess. <laughs> but um, can we can we tell some new stories here, please? Yeah, it's it's tough when you hit the big crescendo and everybody loves it and everybody's happy. We get the happy ending and then we just keep going. <laughs> yes. Um yeah, it's it's uh, it, the we've had the peak and theoretically you could spin Kevin and Sammy off into uh, you know, defend against one of the other teams that the Usos have already beaten perhaps that <laughs> are now fresh challengers now that we have new champions, but no, we're just kind of keeping it going. Um, I guess, yeah, the 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 newest element, which isn't really a new element, because as mentioned, Matt Riddle was feuding with the Bloodline before he, uh, what did he go on vacation? I think he fell on an elevator ship. <laughs> he said, "I'm having trouble staying up this late," and uh, and they sent him home for a little while. Yeah, uh, but yeah, so it's not that's not new, but at least he he was away for for a while and now is back in this mix. But yeah, it's just it's just just feels like a, a WrestleMania hangover. It feels like we're just we're not really sure what we're going to do. I mean, we, I mean, they've done they've set up some matches again. Some stuff might be for TV, but feels like maybe just born out of the Judgment Day uh, Legato Ray stuff. Maybe you do Zelina and Rhea for the title for the SmackDown title on that Puerto Rico show and then. They... Bianca and Io is a setup for the Raw Women's title. Right. So it's not like there's, you know, there's nothing. None of those are bad, I guess. Like, in, I mean, I don't, I don't, none of it lights my world on fire <laughs> either. I mean, Io versus Bianca in a long singles match does sound very good. Uh, but none of that's really lighting the world on fire. But yeah, it's also just that. It just feels like, oh, Bianca's going to wrestle damage control. Well, we saw that from nine months last. <laughs> last year seemingly nine months even though they've only been a staple for six months uh yeah. yeah so none of it feels fresh i think that's fair even with and with cody and brock it's just i don't think the build has been inspired i think everybody's trying their best but i don't know it just just feels like the air's been been let out of the balloon a little bit you know cody's still very over on these shows not not exactly claiming that you know all is lost or anything but uh, yeah, it just doesn't doesn't feel like a hot show. And I think that was uh, something we talked about a lot going into WrestleMania, really all the way from Mania through that Montreal show to or from Rum from the Rumble to, to the Montreal show to WrestleMania. It felt like a hot show with a lot of stuff happening on it. And now we're not. <laughs> and they, uh, they whether this is a, a still a hangover from the positive business trend at coming into WrestleMania, they are in fuego at the box office right now. Mm-hmm. They sold out a house show this past weekend, I believe in New Mexico. They have a stretch of sellouts coming up <laughs> across across the country oh, yeah. and even on an international tour. We do we have to go back twenty plus years to the last time they legitimately sold out a house show <laughs> besides besides Hidalgo, Texas. <laughs> it which does, is yeah. which is a unicorn. <laughs> right? It's like they are legitimately on fire at the box office. I think Peacock has something to do with that. I think just the product being available sure uh helps there. Um, as and as Nick Conn would say, it's created a very robust marketplace. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that, and again, we'll we'll see. To me, that's that's another argument for why Cody should be the champion. <laughs> <laughs> because mm-hmm. Roman Reigns ain't he- headlining any of these shows. <laughs> yeah, um, you know he's not working these. He's certainly not working the house show market. And I guess the argument right now is, well, Cody's not the champion, and he's still his drawing power has is not is just fine obviously generally a bad booking decision you don't usually feel the impact of that two weeks later you feel it 
you know, right. nine months later. So maybe we'll see what our attendance is. You know, not that they need to sell a single ticket to be profitable or anything, but, but yeah, we will see in six or nine months if this Cody thing actually cooled him off in, in the eyes of, you know, the, the true fan, but, right. uh, but yeah, I mean, I think as of right now, it's, it's sold out shows, uh, which begs the question, why, why are we, why did, <laughs> why are the crowd so quiet at TV <laughs> and why are they, why did like Trish Stratus have to get so much noise piped in? I guess because people don't want to boo her is the answer. Cause you could see people audibly cheering for her or you could see people <laughs> cheering while they were piping in booze. So maybe that was more about just not getting the desired reaction they wanted, but like, well, they were, they were wedding her also, but we'll touch on that. We'll touch on that in a second. Yeah. Now, the good news is the draft is coming up. <laughs> oh yeah. Great. Exciting fresh Miz matches. We'll see when we move <laughs> him over to SmackDown. I swear. I swear. It it makes even less sense when um when you, two of the titles are unified. It's like, well, we're gonna see Kevin and Sammy or the Usos on every show, and we're gonna see Roman once a month on either or both shows. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it seems pretty pointless, but I guess it's their idea to pop a rating. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and it, it's it's interesting because. And I know there's been times in the past where either USA or Fox have pushed for drafts. So maybe they know something analytically that we don't. But my thought is always like, why would you want to set up a scenario where even though they just break the brand split whenever they want, so it doesn't matter. But right. like where a Roman Reigns theoretically or a Cody or a Bianca Belair or somebody can't come to your show. <laughs> For a year yes. or whatever. Like, yes. why would you as the network want that? Wouldn't you want to be able to, to have crossover? I guess maybe the allure is, well, we have exclusive people that the other show doesn't. So people will turn in to watch those. But it's like the trade off is also, yeah, but then you're also cutting your star power in half. And so people yes. that want to see those other people won't watch our show. <laughs> Correct. Yes. Is that what they used to call a catch 22? I'm I, not sure. I believe so. All right. <laughs> business wise, this all appears to be appropriate business. <laughs> uh, uh, the secret plan, the secret plan came to fruition. That's right. We're on the road to SummerSlam. Um, the fact that all this stuff is happening on TV now at a backlash makes me think maybe we're getting the match sooner than SummerSlam, or maybe there's going to be multiple matches. Like but maybe Trish we're getting Stratus- it in beautiful Riyadh in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Yeah, that's that's a possibility too. Uh, Trish Stratus turned on Becky Lynch. Uh, we didn't do a show last week, but uh, the secret plan, in fact, <laughs> came to fruition. I've never been happier. <laughs> <laughs> there was a a Monday where uh, Trish Stratus turned heel, and then on uh, Tuesday the uh, Orioles won a game, and my mm-hmm. wife looks at me, uh, my wife Anna looks at me and says. Uh, <laughs> You know, I've seen you smile two days in a row now. <laughs> it's like, well, first of all, that's a barometer of <laughs> where my life is. <laughs> Secondly, all we need to do is have Trish Stratus turn heel and the Baltimore Orioles win baseball games, uh, and uh, and I'm I'm, I'm a happy I'm a happy lad. <laughs> yes, I'm very I'm very happy for you. Um, and hey, we we sort of talked about this going into Mania. I don't remember if we talked about it on the show or not. This is the first time in a while that they've given Becky like something to do. <laughs> yeah. Like something real that feels like top top of the card marquee to do since she came back from her injury last fall. So uh, which maybe they should be doing more of that because I mean, even if you see her as a number two to Bianca now, um, you know, still pretty big deal. <laughs> So maybe it's a good idea to give her something she can actually sink her teeth into. You mentioned Trish's promo on Raw this week. She cut a promo explaining her actions. Mm -hmm. I thought the content of the promo made sense. I thought there were a lot of clever lines in there. The crowd in, I forget what city they were in now, um, was not interested. Mm -mm. (laughs) They were, they were wanting her. They were, um, uh, not interested in booing the legend that 
comes back and works um his work has come back to work this program um they're just they're i don't know i think the jury is out on how the fans are going to react to this and uh as she uh said on busted open this week she wrestled at wrestlemania with a partially torn hamstring you ever had a hamstring injury that hurts yeah <laughs> i've never torn yeah i've never torn anything but i've definitely had injuries from uh yeah that's not fun and that's crazy to be doing that <laughs> at 47 but i guess it's wrestlemania um yep so i guess maybe again if they're gonna do that this saudi show is not that far away now right it's a couple weeks after backlash it's memorial day weekend it is the saturday the 27th so so she's got like another month to to heal up yeah backlash is saturday the 6th uh uh, crown prince is uh (laughs) Saturday the 27th. So it's three weeks in between. Yeah. All right. Uh, that, I think that covers WWE stuff. Uh, what do you think of Trish's promo? Yeah, I thought it was fine. I appreciated that she didn't um, uh, cut an all you people promo. <laughs> and each and every one of you are to blame for me turning heel promo. <laughs> um, that there is a little bit of, yeah, her, her feeling like she's erased from history by... You know, the star of Becky of Becky Lynch is erasing all her hard work. I think that's that's good. It makes sense. I thought her delivery was pretty good. I yeah, I thought I thought it was fine. Like I didn't I wasn't like, oh, my God, I'm so excited for this match yet. But for like a a chapter one uh, of this of this new feud, solid job. <laughs> also, right. she, also, she and Brock dress the same exact way, which is to say they both dress like Jeff Jarrett. All right. <laughs> One has she's gone back to her uh, her debut look now, which is the cowboy hat and the slit like the sleeveless duster. Mm-hmm. Brock, to my knowledge, has never dressed like Jeff Jarrett before. That's true. <laughs> he's yeah, he's added the uh, the long the long. Is there a term? Is it just duster? Is that the code for the, like the? The long coat with the frilly. I believe it's called a duster. Okay. If it's vaguely Western themed and it's long like that, I think you call it a duster. Got it. But yes, I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I thought I thought it was solid. Uh, they tried to, <laughs> I guess, do some weird like Twitter work shoot with Becky uh, on Twitter this week, leading up to Raw, which I didn't understand. Um, yeah, I don't. I still don't know what any of that was about. She's uh, she said she, I'm not going to be at Raw, and then uh, she legitimately wasn't at Raw. Mm-hmm. Changed so. her, changed her Twitter name to her shoot name, and took all mentions of WWE out of her her bio. And uh, well, she wasn't Which, at Raw, but there certainly <laughs> she's under contract, and right, and so it came out she's under contract for another uh, fourteen months, right. <laughs> So I don't know what I don't know what's going on there. Drew McIntyre did the same thing a few weeks ago, and Drew is in our contract for another seven months or something. Right. So, so I, I don't know what anybody's doing. <laughs> I got no idea. A disfaction of uh, disgruntled Irish and Scottish folks. You can have Nick <laughs> Gross in there. Sure, why not? They've they've done. They've done Butch. Just Butch. <laughs> they've done they've done worse things with all these characters. True. <laughs> Remember when Drew McIntyre was Dolph Ziggler's heavy? <laughs> I mean, for, I would never remember it if you hadn't brought it up. But yes, <laughs> for like a full calendar year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that seems like a bad idea. All right, uh, AEW. Hey, CM Punk's probably coming back, and they're probably debuting a new two-hour show on Saturday nights beginning in June and it's probably going to be announced at the upfronts in in May. And uh CM Punk and FTR are on one side doing a uh a uh, a whisper campaign <laughs> and the, the elite and Brandon Cutler are on the other side uh allegedly doing a whisper campaign slash Jericho slash Moxley are doing a whisper campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, these are uh, men in their 30s, 40s, and 50s 
who are all wealthy beyond my imagination who are uh, squabbling. But CM Punk is going to come back and he's going to have a meeting with uh, with uh, Mr. Dickhead and <laughs> and Tony Khan and Chris Jericho to see if he can work with uh, Chris Jericho. Mm-hmm. These are all things that have been reported the last few weeks here. Uh, let's, first of all, two hours, TNT, Saturday nights, 8 to 10 p.m. Mm-hmm. What do you think of that? What do you think of that? Uh, oof. <laughs> I I gotta say, uh, AEW's not lighting my world on fire. Still good in ring most weeks. Um, we can get to dynamite in a minute, but uh, yeah, two more hours of it is not something I'm I'm looking for forward to <laughs> at the moment. I you know I reserve the right to change my tune. Maybe they'll if that's the if the the I guess part of it is that they're gonna maybe do a a soft brand split themselves, um, which seems silly but all of this is silly about a bunch of deeply silly men involved in <laughs> involved in all of this uh but yeah my main thought was oh this was supposed to be the roh show that warner brothers is like no we don't want that we'll do another show with you but we're not doing a roh show we don't want an roh show right yeah so there's that then there's the uh the whole thing where CM Punk is going to be brought back because he's being paid right now to sit at home mm-hmm. and he's providing no value to the company besides selling t-shirts mm-hmm. that uh, Tony Khan's paying him a lot of money and uh, his camp has made sure to leak out that um they are willing to work with the elite And then uh, the elite have uh, put it out. They're not sure that they want to work with CM Punk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you have general thoughts on that? Um, I think for <laughs> we can we can argue this. I like to argue this from the pro punk side, just as a, a thought exercise, and go if you look at this on his side, he feels he was wronged. He feels he was uh, the victim of. of you know, a uh, a torrent of of, of backstage politics. <laughs> sure, and uh, his good name has been thrown in the mud. He right. defended himself and his honor, and you know he was injured anyway. He was going to have to go home, and he thought, "Hey, it's an it's a locker room fight. They happen. A bunch of bunch of grown men. Let's just put it behind us and let's work together. I'm being right. the bigger man here, right?" Um. So on that side of it, yeah, he if if and again, as we said at the time, if he if the way he laid out events is the way they happened. I can understand why he doesn't think he has a lot to apologize for. Sure. Um, that being said, I think if you look at it on on the other side of this <laughs> mm. and the guy who uh, punched you in the face. <laughs> And whose friend, his friend bit you, yeah. uh, says, you know what? I'm willing to be the bigger man and work with you. <laughs> <laughs> I could understand why you wouldn't be crazy about that. <laughs> sure. But again, that's a, you know, elite friendly way of looking at it where they were in the right and they had a right to barge into his locker room when he was in a, you know, a state of uh, mania. <laughs> <laughs> for lack of a better term <laughs> that night sure and saying that they had a right to go in there and they were just going to discuss it and he attacked them completely unprovoked sure then i can i i, I don't know like like i said this feels like a bunch of very deeply silly men <laughs> yes who are all taking themselves very very seriously um i do think there's something to the the talking point of well whoever the first side if whether or not these people actually any of them are willing to work with each other, it behooves somebody to get it out first that they're willing to do business because if business is not done, then it automatically goes against as a, as a PR point against your, your uh, enemies. (laughs) Yes. For lack of a better term. (laughs) 
Yes. Um, but yeah, if I and looking at this at the third party, i.e., the guy who's actually in charge of this company, allegedly. Yeah. Um, I don't know why you would bring CM Punk back if he weren't going to work with the elite, because what is everyone, Tony, Punk, the Bucks, Kenny, FTR going to be asked about in every media appearance, in every meet and greet they do on the street? <laughs> They're going to be asked about this constantly forever. And it's just going to hang over both, you know, all of these people's careers until if they're all working in the same company and they don't do something. So why would you bring them back if you're not going to do it? Other than I guess you just, you know, you think it's worth it to bring him back and put him on his own little island where he only works with his friends. And that's that's still going to be enough to you know, anchor a third television program and and keep people invested, even though they're not doing the most obvious and most lucrative feud they could do with him. Let me, uh, let me, I would like to address this brew ha ha. <laughs> if I can invoke a little French, please do. <laughs> I think the idea that has been floated by media personalities that all right dave Meltzer said here's how cm punk and ftr <laughs> can uh can make this work they can apologize to the elite and they can offer to put them over mm. and, th- and that's how they can work together brian alvarez of uh wrestling observer said um you know cm punk wants to work with the elite the elite don't want to work with him. Maybe if Punk wanted to work with the elite, he shouldn't have punched them. Okay. Which is a fair point, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it all comes down to this. Tony Khan is in charge. Mm-hmm. And there shouldn't be a democracy here. There shouldn't be people saying that they don't want to work with other people. It should be the boss telling which... <laughs> telling the people Mm -hmm. people you're going to work with these people and the people saying okay yes boss yes sir got it (laughs) why why is this difficult like why does it (sighs) that's the the most irritating thing to me okay and you can go back to the original brouhaha and you could say (laughs) Was Hangman Page out of line cutting a promo, bringing real life things into a promo with CM Punk? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Was he unprofessional for that? Yeah, probably. Like to me, that's not as cut and dried as CM Punk being unprofessional for the receipt, just because, (laughs) you know, you're trying to build up a match. Maybe your instincts aren't the greatest. Maybe there's no real reason for two baby faces to be feuding. So you Mm got to conjure something up. Eh. I like and of all the elite guys, I like Hangman the best. So I don't <laughs> like I don't like starting blaming him for everything. He's going but, to give him the benefit of the doubt, right? But it's like after that promo, when when Phil got real mad, it's like okay, well maybe you need to sit Hangman and Phil down and say, look, Hangman is sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even if he isn't, he could say, hey man, sorry, I, I uh, anyway. They could have squashed that beef. Hangman could have been uh, chastised verbally, whatever. Punk then he has the choice to give the receipt or not verbally. And if he does, he should have been suspended. We said that at the time. You mm-hmm. can't have guys handing out receipts, unscripted receipts on your live television. You mm-hmm. just can't have that. <laughs> So you know, even like, you know, to, to bring up the Bret Hart comparison, it's like sure. at least when Brett and Sean were taking digs at each other, they were on television together. <laughs> yes. So that they, they were in a program. Right. They were building to a match, even if they were both unprofessional in what they said to build the match, they were building a match. Yeah. And and to defend the hangman, the hangman was. Right. First time, and then Punk's receipt. Punk was back to feud with John Moxley, <laughs> <laughs> who then only agreed to put Punk over if Punk put him over first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fascinating. 
absolutely fascinating. Anyway, what we have here is a picture of a locker room that is just the inmates are running the asylum. And uh, a boss could step in and and make all of this uh, moot. And we can avoid any further brouhaha's, if I can invoke a little French, uh, to uh, to to uh, squash anything. I don't like the idea of two more hours on Saturday nights. Um, the Friday night show doesn't do well unless it's on after the NBA playoffs or unless CM Punk is coming back to wrestling after uh, seven and a half years away. Um, I, I don't know how, how well the Saturday night show is going to do, but I guess... We'll see. WWE does five hours of first round programming a week, also, but they also have been doing that for twenty four years now, and they have a head start in the marketplace. And I don't know if there's a lot of demand for um, a B show or a one A show for AEW right now, but I guess we'll see. Yeah, I mean, hey. I understand why if Warner comes to you and says, we want two more hours a week, you're not going to say no to that. Right. It's it's the thunder argument, right? It's like people yes. point to thunder as ultimately being pretty detrimental to WCW by overexposing the product. But in the moment, the Bischoff argument, and it's, a, I, you know, I'm not going to say it's a bad argument was, yeah, they're paying us money. And they want two hours on Thursday nights in addition to the three hours I'm already giving them. I'm not right. going to say no to that. <laughs> right. So what you got to do? AEW Dynamite this week. Um, mixed bag of a show. A lot of folks didn't seem to like it. Mm-hmm. Um, count out finish in the main event. <laughs> Bizarre doesn't happen very often in AEW. Mm-mm. Real heavy heat angle with uh, Jericho and Britt Baker and Adam Cole. And uh, just what are your thoughts on the uh, the AEW program in general? I guess we're not getting a four way with the Pillars uh, next month, and instead we're getting um, the winner of Darby and Sammy against MJF because I guess maybe um, they've listened to the Jungle Boys promos. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think I owe you a dollar for that because um, I said I think I said it was going to be a four way. So I, if anything, though, I, I think we should call that a push because <laughs> I've been thinking about this and it's like I think I was going to argue that it was going to be a singles with Jungle Boy. And it's like, well, now Jungle Boy is the only one eliminated from the scenario. <laughs> right. I mean, they could still due to the interference, they could which would be a very WWE thing. But you can have MJF cheat to help Sammy beat Darby next week too, and then you know Tony comes out on the on the stage and says, "Since you cheated, it's a four way, and you do the four way anyway." Which I wouldn't, because then you still beat your two baby faces going into the title, even if it was through you know nefarious means. But I guess they could still get back to a four way. But yeah, at this point, I I would probably just do just do him and Darby too. To Darby's low credit, I think his promos among other than MJF of these four have been the best in this uh, this little this little. Which again, not I'm not saying they've been particularly good. I just think they've been better than uh, Jungle Jacks and Sammys. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's an interesting match to uh, main event your show with. Obviously, there will be other stuff on on that card like apparently Adam Cole and Chris Jericho and, and some kind of elite Blackpool combat club thing. But yeah, um, just don't just doesn't uh, kind of what we were just saying with WWE it just doesn't feel like a hot show. I don't, I don't hate the, any of like the matchups. I mean, Adam Cole and Chris Jericho doesn't do a lot for me. Um, Cause Chris Jericho doesn't do a lot for me currently. Um, but but just didn't just didn't feel like I you know what I will give it a compliment. I think Wardlow and Powerhouse Hobbs had the best match that those two guys are ever going to have together. <laughs> as far as like a regular wrestling match, uh, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the big men throwing each other around. So that was that was a plus, and I liked the women's tag match. So it's not like there was nothing good on the show. 
Um, but also Jay White is uh, feuding with Sean Spears. <laughs> well, he's feuding with Ricky Starks and they're going to do a tag match that involves Sean Spears. But um, yeah, just, just not lighting, just not lighting the world on fire. Other than, like I said, I'm, I, I, I kind of, I've, I've mostly enjoyed the elite uh, combat club stuff, but otherwise it's been a, a bit of a mixed bag, I think for, for a while now. The elite BCC stuff, I think is the best stuff right now. It's probably the most serious stuff the elite have done in a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, Blackpool Combat Club. Thank goodness Danielson is there to do the talking to get across that this is a heel group because mm-hmm. otherwise these guys are portrayed as cool ass kickers who bleed all the time. Like how mm-hmm. what what's there to dislike about the Blackpool Combat Club? I was gonna say there's very little difference between uh this current Moxley's promos and his top babyface promos from last summer as far as content. So yeah, good point there that Danielson's the one out there with like the the S eating grin on his face being a <laughs> being a real stinker out there. Yeah, that stuff's good. Did you like uh, Don Callis leading Takeshita down like Miss Elizabeth leading Hogan to save Savage? Uh I don't like pretty much anything Don Callis is involved in. Um Unless it's a commentary on New Japan shows like six years ago, mm-hmm. um, I think he's a bad person, <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, and I he's he's an entertaining enough television personality, but he's much better as a heel, and he's currently a baby face by default, so that's bad. No, I think that's bad. <laughs> I think everything they've done with Takashita has pretty much. I don't know. Maybe there was a month there where after they, they be, here's, here's, Takeshita, here's Takeshita's tra- trajectory in AEW. They bring him in. They beat him for two solid months. They put him on every show. He gets great reactions in every match. They beat him every single time. Mm-hmm. Then they start calling him the Japanese phenomenon <laughs> after we've seen him lose eight straight matches. And they really like WWE brand him with this Japanese phenomenon thing. And then he wins like three matches in a row. And then he gets like a world title match or a number one contenders match or something. And then he loses that. And then he disappears. And then he disappears mm-hmm. off the face of the earth for six months or six weeks. And then he comes back. And uh, after hints like two months ago that uh, Don Callis was after him, mm-hmm. he's uh, now signed to Don Callis apparently. Uh, but we don't know because it, it's underexplained. Um, so now he's back. Uh, that seems like a poor way to uh, to handle someone's career to me. Yeah, that to me is the thing. It's like the it's it's inaccurate to say that they don't tell stories or they don't tell long term stories. It's how they tell them and the pace that they tell them and the way that, as you just pointed out, they'll start a story, which was Don Cal's recruiting Takeshita like six months ago. <laughs> Yes. And then we'll see it, but then we don't see it for a month. And then suddenly Takeshita has a match and we see Callus backstage. Um, and then it's like, oh, but we haven't seen any of these people or this hasn't really been alluded to in like a really long time. So it's like it is by, I suppose, the definition it is, quote unquote, long term storytelling, but it's not cohesive storytelling because you do it for a month and then you take two months off and then you bring it back. That's not really a good story. It's like you're reading the first chapter of the book and then the fifth chapter of a book and then the last chapter of a book. It's not, it's not, it's not a cohesive way. And sometimes the payoffs are still good. And sometimes you can look back at something and go, okay, that was, you know, overall that was good and it was worth the wait. But I think the week to week storytelling, and again, that's not a new problem for AEW, but the week to week storytelling is where I think these types of stories suffer a lot. So they announced Commander signing uh, during Dynamite this week. Mm-hmm. So Commander debuted in AEW uh, in March. The first week of March, he was in the face of the Revolution ladder match. He did not win the ladder match. Mm-hmm. Next time we see Commander was on a Ring of Honor pay-per-view. 
he challenged uh, uh, Ohio Del Vikingo for the AAA Mega title. He lost. The next time we see him is um, either on a Dynamite or a Rampage against Sammy Guevara, mm-hmm. and he he lost he lost that match. And then we saw him last night against Jay White in a real Styles clash. Um, although Jay's Jay's just the best at being a heel, <laughs> getting his ass kicked. I've, I've been saying this for years. He's but he's better at his job than Ric Flair was at his job. <laughs> um. But uh, Commander lost that match also. So in uh, Tony Khan promotions, he's uh, 0-4. And then they announced that he he signed. And he'll probably be branded like the Mexican Phenomenon or something now. Mm-hmm. So so there's that. I got no problem with signing Commander. The guy's great. But the way that they do things is is bad. Anyway, what do you think yeah. of that angle with uh, where they intertwined uh, Cole's story with... Uh, with Baker's story and the outcasts and Jericho and and uh, all that is that reality show fodder only? Is it uh, is that just oh that's a pleasant uh, side effect of this? Is we're going to get a bunch of footage for the reality show, or is it uh, I, this is a real uh, it had strong Triple H versus Randy Orton with Stephanie mm-hmm. uh, uh, vibes to me, but. Uh, Yes, they did an angle where uh, Jericho and his his cronies handcuff Adam Cole to the ropes, and then they have uh, they pay the outcasts to come out and whack Britt with a kendo stick. Um, it was the tone of it is more serious than a lot of things that AEW does. Yeah, and um, I just want to know what you think of it. Um, I I think the idea was interesting as you said yeah. it is pretty reminiscent of a of a wwe angle so i don't know about you know i don't know maybe they maybe that part of it is what took me out of it the main part um i thought was that for the amount of uh acting the N- the nxt <laughs> acting class is really paying off for adam cole or austin which you may have subtly heard uh, shoot names Baker. Britt Baker calling him his shoot name of Austin. Um, that means that means this is real and the rest yeah, that, of the show is fake. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's how you know. Um, uh, there, his acting and Brit's selling and acting uh, perhaps would have been more warranted uh, if uh, Soraya's uh, Kendo's <laughs> shit, that six shots weren't um, the most dog shit Kendo six shots I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. <laughs> Because, oh, that's too bad. Uh, she was tapping her very lightly, like she was a child hitting a pinata, <laughs> and at a birthday party, and 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 Brit is screaming bloody murder, and and Adam Cole is begging and pleading uh, to uh, for them to let her to let her go. Um, also, I feel like the the best part of that, um, or one of the better parts of that Orton Triple H angle, which was a legitimately phenomenal angle at the time um was that at a certain point like triple h is is pulling on the cuffs and he's yelling and screaming but then randy orton like goes over and hits him with a sledgehammer so he can just Mm. be down selling so he doesn't have to just keep going stop stop please let her go stop for like 10 straight minutes which Mm -hmm. instead which is what adam cole had to do in this segment so like if after like 30 seconds of that Daniel Garcia or Jericho like booted him at least so he could be down for a little bit before he went back to pleading. Maybe that would have also been uh, better. So I guess I'm saying I don't hate the angle. I don't hate the idea of the angle. It will probably make for a good video package where you can edit this into looking a lot more brutal than it did. But as a live segment, I thought uh, kind of all let down by how uh unserious the attack that was befalling Brit looked and felt. That's fair. You were to ask me to give a kendo stick to one of the three members of the outcasts and lay it in and make it look good. Soraya is not the one that I would do that with. Yeah, I know she's like the de facto like leader of this little this little group. Yes, but uh, yeah, no. Give it to, 
probably give it to Tony, but give it to literally anyone else. Uh, and that segment is probably a lot better and <laughs> a lot, uh, a lot more memorable to me. But you know, hey, we we tried something. <laughs> We took a big swing, didn't we? We did. Soraya didn't, but the the company did. So we're going back uh, uh, just very quickly. I want to touch on this. Speaking about you, your point about a long term storytelling in AEW, last week's program was headlined by Chris Jericho versus Keith Lee, a fascinating contest <laughs> for a number of reasons. But uh, Swerve Strickland interfered and cost Keith the match. This was Keith's first singles match on AEW programming since November, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Keith and Swerve, who were um, former tag team champions, um, and then lost the titles w- when? At, at Arthur Ashe in September? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they So they, they've been feuding... I guess they broke up not long after that. Yeah, they did the bit where, well, they stayed together because I think they were still together. They challenged for the tag titles like one more time, I think, at the November pay-per-view, maybe. Full gear, sure. Second week in November. So then they break up. They do the beat. They do the bit where Swerve breaks the cinder block across his chest. So Keith is out for a while. Yeah. And then he comes he... back. He comes back with gray hair and a cape. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like what in January? First week of January, maybe? Yeah, December, January, something like that. Okay. So that <laughs> even even if it was I'll even give you February. It's still been two, <laughs> it's still been over two months. <laughs> and and then this they just pick up the story again. Yeah. Like Keith's been it's back. Weird. He and he and Dustin wrestled Swerve and the the the, the tubby kid. <laughs> That NXT fired. <laughs> um, Harland. Yes. And they. Uh, Parker Boudreaux. That's right. And I guess they decided that he's not ready for prime time after all. And uh, so he disappeared into the ether. And now Swerve is a- allied with Prince Nana and Brian Cage. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. The uh, the mogul affiliates have become the embassy mogul, the embassy affiliates, the mogul embassy. I don't know. Sure. Don't know. Brian, Brian Cage signed for five more years. That's great. <laughs> wow, they got him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's one of those guys, just like I saw Nick Aldis showed up on Impact uh, this past yes. week. Yes. It's like he's those... back with Impact Wrestling. Right. They got him. What a, what a steal. He's just those yeah. types of guys. They've all there are guys who have always been guys and they're always going to be guys <laughs> like but it's like WWE could have had Nick Aldis or Brian Cage any time from like what 2014 yeah to present yep and they just for whatever reason there's certain people possibly you know I think the answer with Brian Cage is uh drug test maybe allegedly sure but uh his physique doesn't look natural I think that's fair to say, you know, I could be wrong, but, uh, but yeah, it's just Brian Cage signing for five more years. I was like, well, yeah, where's he going to (laughs) go back to impact or the NWA. And I don't think either of those places are going to pay him. Like he, uh, like he gets paid in AEW. And also he's like 43 and probably doesn't want to do regular indie bookings all the time anymore. Yeah. Nick Aldis and Brian Cage. Have have signed new contracts. That's that's wonderful. That's great. Uh, wrapping up our uh, trip around the world here. Uh, Sonata finally beat Okada to win the IWGP title. They did a bit of a different match than they always do, which was just my what I was begging for. <laughs> but uh, Sonata has left Lij. He's joined the Five Guys group and is now the champion. He serves delicious hamburgers. In his free time. Fresh, fresh, never frozen beef. That's right. Hand cut French fries. Gives you a little a little dish of peanuts while you wait for your food. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So Sonata is the is the champion there. And then uh Stardom this weekend has their biggest all-star grand queendom. 
they don't they don't half ass it when it comes to naming shows. Uh, the All Star Grand Queendom, and it's uh, Mercedes Money against Mayu Iwatani for uh, the IWGP Women's Championship. Mercedes original contract expired after the show. They're talking about doing at least one more date with her and Julia after this, so. We can keep an eye on on the finish for this, but the original plan, the original idea, would have been Mercedes uh, putting over Iwatani. I'm sure Mercedes is working, by the way. At uh, she's doing work shoot stuff on her Twitter, where she's talking about uh, she wants to buy real estate in Japan and she mm-hmm. wants to live in Japan permanently and all this stuff. But uh, I, I I don't know. But she'll be uh, she'll be. I I always take her media stuff social media and media media with a grain of salt. Um, but seems like she is uh, maybe deciding whether to wrap up this little international excursion uh, this summer here or, uh, or keep it going, I guess. And, and for how long to keep, to keep it going. But uh, the, the big match was always going to be Mercedes and Mayo Iwatani. And then and I feel like the match the Julia match is uh, really for pervs. And um, <laughs> I can't imagine how horny Twitter is going to be if Mercedes wrestles Julia. My God. Mm-hmm. I I can't imagine. I cannot imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine that match. It's... It seems like a bad idea to do it for that reason. Uh, well, considering but, uh, this week she was talking about like, Hey, hello, Japanese fans. Please don't follow me to my house. Yes. Um, well. <laughs> Boy, that seems like a bad idea. You know, some stereotypes about wrestling fans could be true sometimes, unfortunately. And they're international. They break international bonds. Mm-hmm. I hope they smell better, at least. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So there's any thoughts on uh, kind of how she broke a rib? Working in the United States, New Japan ran back-to-back pay-per-views in Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia this past weekend. Um, Part of their new taping strategy where they do monthly pay-per-views and then chop them up into their one-hour blocks for their streaming service and for Access TV or whatever. But uh, Tanahashi uh, broke a rib and then had to do a meet and greet the next day at the old ECW arena. That sounds like cruel and unusual punishment. But the, any thoughts on any of this Japanese stuff? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think it's it's exciting that it feels like we've just gotten going. I really enjoyed the uh, the three way that Mercedes had at the last New Japan show. So I'd like to see her stick around like I'd like to see her stretch her legs a little bit more. Uh, so I hope this isn't it for for her run in in Japan. Uh yeah, I, 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 and and yeah, the 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 Julia match is the is probably the one. But I mean, here if you think okay, this is coming to an end, and so she's gonna put over Mayu, and then she beats Mayu, then you maybe build for another six months or whatever, and you do a rematch where she does finally lose. So feels like there'd be if you know it could be financially beneficial for all if they could you know if they could convince her to stay for another few months and stretch this out a little bit longer. So I hope to see that. Yeah, it's funny. We were talking because they're doing this tournament to, uh, as far as the Tanahashi thing goes, uh, to decide who's going to face Kenny. At, is it at Forbidden Door? Is the next... They haven't officially said, but it's most likely going to be at Forbidden Door, yes. And just like as like a first round matchup, they had Osprey and Tanahashi in there. And I was like, I know they don't book Tanahashi like a main event guy anymore, but right. that still seems like a really big match to just do. Like <laughs> these guys are going to wrestle to see which one of them gets to wrestle somebody else. Like that feels like that could be like a number, still be like a number two or three match on a Tokyo Dome show. And, and they've only had to your point when you brought this up, they've only had one singles match ever. I think. And uh, and uh, Tanahashi put over Osprey in, in a G one a few years ago. But yeah, they're fighting for the to see who gets to wrestle Lance Archer. <laughs> what? I just, yeah, I just that I again I guess we we come back to how even though Tanahashi 
is held together with ice and tape and he can't he can't really walk anymore. He's still incredible and New Japan doesn't <laughs> The way New I don't know, like I said, that that just really struck me, even though, like I said, I feel like we're used to it by now of how they how they book him and and you and use him at this point. Um like like gosh, just him being a setup guy for a <laughs> setup guy <laughs> for another setup guy to wrestle Kenny Omega down the line. It's just like wow, that's yeah, yeah. that's really short sighted. Like you need yeah. <laughs> you re- you have a billion shows you run every year that you're still like need to sell tickets to <laughs> to make money. Yes. And you're just doing Os- you're not doing Osprey and Tanashi like on a dome show or a Dominion or some big time pay-per-view. It's just it's just happening. <laughs> yes. There was there's always they never learn and there's always one show a year at least where somebody gets hurt or somebody gets covid. <laughs> Like when they like a couple summers ago, they were running the Tokyo Dome in the summer for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> and somebody got COVID <laughs> like the day before a show, and Tanahashi wasn't booked on the dome, and they had it with Shingo as the champ, I think, and they had mm-hmm. to put Shingo and Tanahashi together on like twenty four hours notice <laughs> to headline the Tokyo Dome. It's like you're gonna need Tanahashi, and you're gonna need him to be protected enough to wrestle for the world title if he has to <laughs> right. they never learn they never learn <sighs> well again I feel as though I said too much um yeah but Mercedes and Julia uh, my I just no I I, I I'm gonna have to uh, mute everyone on social media when that when that match starts it's just is that of, the horn? Is that the horniest match Twitter could Twitter could book? I think if they booked Mercedes versus what's the the blonde haired American girl in Stardom right now? Uh, Maria May or Maria May. Maria May. I think May that is. would that would give it a run for its money, but that's the only one I can think of. It could maybe if they added Hater to it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if they did, Mer- if if Mercedes versus Jamie Hader gets booked on this run at some point, that could that could set a new record. But yeah, in Julia and Mercedes is definitely a front runner at the moment. All right. Ah, <sighs> well, we said a lot. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to cover? No, I think we've uh, we've covered just the right amount of ground, and we should get out of here before we spend any more time inventing horny wrestling matches. Alright, sounds good. Till next time, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Lost my blue check mark today. Uh, that was literally going to be the, the <laughs> thing I asked you about. We're in a post blue check world now. Yes. Except for the people that are paying for it and the people that Elon Musk is personally paying for to keep it. Oh, well. <laughs> I mean, just, we're here. We're back 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> just imagine someone else could basically clone your username. Yeah. And post results of ROH's TV tonight impersonating you. Yeah. Yeah. There's very little um, benefit to trying to uh, impersonate me. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine the real celebrity. I mean, we we tried this already, like when they first rolled out the everyone gets a blue check mark if you pay $8 thing where... <laughs> Right. Like a, an accounts that looked like the official Chiquita accounts were like, sorry about all the genocide, folks. <laughs> no more bananas. What? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, a good day for people that uh believe or know 
that this world isn't a meritocracy because you just get to watch the richest man in the world be very stupid and also his rocket blew up so you know you can see him have a bad day and just step on rake after rake it's beautiful (laughs) stepping on rakes Mm -hmm. it's a beautiful uh beautiful visual analogy there i try to keep on keeping on 